Hello, Year 8. I hope that you're all well. Um, so today we are going to be reading Chapter 3 of Five Children and It, but we're going to start just recapping what happened in Chapter 2. So Chapter 2 was called Golden Guineas, and it started with the children waking up and very much thinking that they were or had been in some sort of dream and it wasn't real. Um, then they realised that it had been real and they went down to make another wish to the Samiad or Sand Fairy. Um, the very first thing that they asked was um, that the servants uh, would not be able to notice or see uh, the results of any of their wishes. So I uh, remember in chapter one and they all changed and became as beautiful as the day and the staff didn't recognize them. So the children were trying to prevent anything like that happening again. So that was interesting. Then the children uh, wished for lots of lots of gold um, as, as much as the um, sand pit that, that the Samiad lives in. So he fills it with gold um, and yes, so they have, um, initially they're just playing with it and then they decide to go into Rochester to hire a pony and cart and go into Rochester and spend the money. And along the way, um, also they have to leave bits of money in various places because it's so heavy and they've carried so much. So even though they've asked for this money and it seems lovely at first, it becomes quite burdensome in the end. Um, once they get into Rochester, they try and spend it in various places and nobody will accept their money because it's in guineas. Um, and they end up paying for certain things with their own money. They end up becoming quite dishevelled and dirty um, and... They even at one point go into a baker's um, and because they know that their money isn't going to be accepted, they quickly uh, pick up some penny buns and bite into them so that the baker can't, um, so the baker can't uh, not, so he can't, so he'll accept their money and he takes the money, um, bites it to check that it's real and then sends them on their way and says, you're lucky I'm not telling the police. Um, so then eventually they go and try to buy some, or one of the boys goes to try and buy some horses and the police are called on them and they're marched to the police station. They see their nanny and the baby in in Rochester um, she can't see the money so when the police are dragging them off she can't see that their pockets are full of golden guineas and she thinks that the police are just being very nasty um, they get to the police station and then they go to empty out their pockets and their pockets are empty because of course the sun's gone down the wish has ended and it's the end of the day so the nanny then chastises the police again and takes them home and they're very glad to be home and on their way, um, on their way home away from, um, away from the police and all the drama. So we're going to read chapter three now. So just give me a second while I change and put the VLE. I hope that you're managing to log in okay and just um, please email myself or your whoever your English teachers are if you need your logins. So I'm going to get started. So chapter three is called Being Wanted. The morning after the children had been the possessors of boundless wealth and had been unable to buy anything really useful or enjoyable with it except two pairs of cotton gloves, 12 penny buns, an imitation crocodile skin purse and a ride in a pony cart, they awoke without any of the enthusiastic happiness which they had felt on the previous day when they remembered how they had, had had the luck to find a Samiad or sand fairy 
and to receive its promise to grant them a new wish every day. For now, they had had two wishes, beauty and wealth, and neither had exactly made them happy. But the happening of strange things, even if they are not completely pleasant things, is more amusing than those times when nothing happens but meals, and they are not always completely pleasant, especially on the days when it is cold mutton or hash. There was no chance of talking things over before breakfast because everyone overslept itself as it happened and it needed a vigorous and determined struggle to get dressed so as to be only 10 minutes late for breakfast. During this meal, some efforts were made to deal with the question of the Samoyed in an impartial spirit, but it is very difficult to discuss anything thoroughly and at the same time to attend faithfully to your baby brother's breakfast needs. The baby was particularly lively that, that morning. He had not only wriggled his body through the bar of his high chair and hung by his head, choking and purple, but he collared a tablespoon with desperate suddenness, hit Cyril heavily on the head with it, and then cried because it was taken away from him. He put his fat fist in his bread and milk and demanded nam, which was only allowed for tea. He sang, he put his feet on the table, he clamoured, go walkie. The conversation was something like this. Look here, about that sand fairy. Look out, he'll have the milk over. Milk removed to a safe distance. Yes, about that fairy, no lamb. No lamb, dear, give panther the, give panther the, the narky poon. Then Cyril tried. Nothing we've had yet has turned out. He nearly had the mustard that time. I wonder whether we'd better wish, hello, you've done it now, my boy, and in a flash of glass and pink baby paws, the bowl of golden carp in the middle of the table rolled on its side and poured a flood of mixed water and goldfish into the baby's lap and into the laps of the others. Everyone was almost as upset as the goldfish, the lamb only remaining calm. When the pool on the floor had been mopped up and the leaping, gasping goldfish had been collected and put back in the water, the baby was taken away to be entirely redressed by Martha and most of the others had to change completely. The pinafores and jackets that had been bathed in goldfish and water were hung out to dry and then it turned out that Jane must either mend the dress she had torn the day before or appear all day in her best petticoat. It was white and soft and frilly and trimmed with lace and very, very pretty. Quite as pretty as a frock, if not more so. Only it was not a frock and Martha's word was law. She wouldn't let Jane wear her best frock and she refused to listen for a moment to Robert's suggestion that Jane should wear her best petticoat and call it a dress. It's not respectable, she said, and when people say that, it's no use anyone saying anything. You will find out find this out for yourselves some day. So there was nothing for it but for Jane to mend her frock. The hole had been torn the day before, when she happened to tumble down in the high street of Rochester, just where a water cart had passed on its silvery way. She had grazed her knee, and her stocking was much more than grazed, and her dress was cut by the stains the same stone which had attended to the knee and the stocking. Of course, the others were not such sneaks as to abandon a comrade in misfortune. So they all sat on the grass. So they all sat on the grass plot round the sundial and Jane darned away for dear life. The lamb was still in the hands of Martha, having its clothes changed. So conversation was possible. Anthea and Robert timidly, timidly tried to conceal their in, inmost thought, which was that the Samiad was not to be trusted. But Cyril said, Speak out, say what you've got to say. I hate hinting and don't know and sneakish ways like that. So when, so then Robert said, as in honour bound, sneak yourself. Anthea and me weren't so goldfishy as you two were, so we got changed quicker and we've had time to think it over if you ask, and if you ask me. I didn't ask you, said Jane, biting off a needle full of thread as she always as she had always been strictly forbidden to do. I don't care who asks or who doesn't, said Robert, but Anthea and I think that the Samiad is a spiteful brute. 
If, if it can give us our wishes, I suppose it can give itself its own. And I feel almost, almost sure it wishes every time that our wishes shan't do us any good. Let's let the tiresome beast alone and just go and have a jolly good game of forts on our own in the chalk pit. You will remember that the happily situated house where these children were spending their holidays lay between a chalk quarry and a gravel pit. Cyril and Jane were more hopeful. They generally were. I don't think the Samiad does it on purpose, Cyril said. And after all, it was silly to wish for boundless wealth. Fifty pounds in two shilling pieces would have been much more sensible. And wishing to be beautiful as the day was simply donkeyish. I don't want to be dis disagreeable, but it was. We must try to find a really useful wish and wish it. Jane dropped her work and said, I think so too. It's too silly to have a chance like this and not to use it. I never heard of anyone else outside a book who had such a chance. There must be simply heaps of things we could wish for that wouldn't turn out dead sea fish like these two, like these two things have. Do let's think hard and wish something nice so that we can have a real jolly day, what there is left of it. Jane darned away again like mad, for time was indeed getting on, and everyone began to talk at once. If you had been there, you could not possibly have made head or tail of the talk, but these children were used to talking by fours, a soldier's march, and each of them could say what it had to say quite comfortably and listen to the agreeable sound of its own voice and at the same time have three quarters of two sharp ears to spare for listening to what the others said. That is an easy example in multiplication of vulgar fractions, but, as I dare say, you can't do even that. I won't ask you to tell me whether three quarters times two equals one and a half, but I will ask you to believe me that this was the amount of ear each child was able to lend the others. Lending ears was common in Roman times, as we learn from Shakespeare, but I fear I am getting too instructive. When the frock was darned, the start for the gravel pit was delayed by Martha's insisting on everybody's washing its hands, which was nonsense because nobody had been doing anything at all except Jane, and how can you get dirty doing nothing? That is a difficult question, and I cannot answer it on paper. In real life, I could very soon show you, or me, which is much more likely. During the conversation in which the six ears were lent, there were four children, so that sum comes right. It had been decided that £50 in two shilling pieces was the right wish to have. And the lucky children, who could have anything in the wide world by just wishing for it, hurriedly started for the gravel pit to express their wishes to the Samiad. Martha caught them at the gate and insisted on their taking the baby with them. Not to want him indeed. Why, everybody would want him a duck. With all their hearts they would. And you know you promised your ma to take him out, blessed day, said Martha. I know we did, said Robert in gloom, but I wish the lamb wasn't quite so young and small. It would be so much it would be much better fun taking him out. He'll mend of his youngness with time, said Martha. And as for his smallness, I don't think you'd fancy carrying of him any more, however big he was. Besides, he can walk a bit, bless his precious fat legs, a ducky. He feels the benefit of the new laid air, so he does a pet. With this and a kiss, she plumped the lamb into Anthea's arms and went back to make new pinafores on the sewing machine. She was a rapid performer on this instrument. The lamb laughed with pleasure and said, walk you with panty and rode on Robert's back with yells of joy and tried to feed Jane with stones and all together made himself so agreeable that nobody could long be sorry that he was of the party. The enthusiastic Jane even suggested that they should devote a week's wishes to assuring the baby's future by asking such gifts for him as the good fairies give to infant princes in proper fairy tales. But Anthea soberly reminded her that as the Sand Fairy's wishes only lasted till sunset, they could not ensure any benefit to the baby's later years. And Jane owned that it would be better to wish for £50 in two shilling pieces and buy the lamb a £3.15 rocking horse 
like those in the army and navy stores list with the part of with part of the money it was settled that as soon as they had wished for the money and got it they would get mr crispin to drive them into rochester again taking martha with them if they could not get out of taking her and they would make a list of the things they really wanted before they started Full of high hopes and excellent resolutions, they went round the safe, slow cart road to the gravel pits, and as they went in between the mounds of gravel, a sudden thought came to them, and would have turned their ruddy cheeks pale if they had been children in a book. Being real live children, it only made them stop and look at each other with a rather blank, with rather blank and silly expressions. For now they remembered that yesterday, when they had asked the Samiad for boundless wealth, and it was getting ready to fill the quarry with the minted gold of bright guineas, millions of them. It had told the children to run along outside the quarry for fear they should be buried alive in the heavy, splendid treasure, and they had run, and so it happened that they had not had time to mark the spot where the Samiad was with a ring of stones as before. And it was this thought that put such silly expressions on their faces. Never mind, said the hopeful Jane, we'll soon find him. But this, though easily said, was hard in the doing. They looked and they looked, and though they found their seaside spades, nowhere could they find the sand fairy. At last they had to sit down and rest, not at all because they were weary or disheartened, of course, or disheartened, of course, but because the lamb insisted on being put down and you cannot look very carefully after anything you may have happened to lose in the sand if you have an active baby to look after at the same time. Get someone to drop your best knife in the sand next time you go to the seaside and then take your baby brother with you when you go to look for it and you will see the time right. The lamb, as Martha had said, was feeling the benefit of the country air and he was as frisky as a sand hopper. The elder ones longed to go on talking about the new wishes they would have they would have when or if they found the Samiad again, but the lamb wished to enjoy himself. He watched his opportunity and threw a handful of sand into Anthea's face and then suddenly bur burrowed his own head in the sand and waved his fat legs in the air. Then, of course, the sand got into his eyes as it had into Anthea's and he howled. The thoughtful Robert had brought one solid brown bottle of ginger beer with him, relying on a thirst that had never yet failed him. This had to be uncorked hurriedly. It was the only wet thing within reach, and it was necessary to wash the sand out of the lamb's eyes somehow. Of course, the ginger hurt terribly, and he howled more than ever. And amid his anguish of kicking, the bottle was upset, and the beautiful ginger beer frothed out into the sand, and was lost forever. It was then that Robert, usually a very patient brother, so far forgot himself as to say, Anybody would want him indeed, only they don't, Martha. Only they don't. Martha doesn't, not really, or she'd jolly well keep him with her. He's a little nuisance, that's what he is. It's too bad. I only wish every everybody did want him with all their hearts, we might get some peace in our lives. The lamb stopped howling now because Jane had suddenly remembered that there is only one safe way of taking things out of little children's eyes and that is with your own soft wet tongue. It is quite easy if you love the baby as much as you ought to. Then there was a little silence. Robert was not proud of himself for having been so cross and the others were not proud of him either. You often notice that sort of silence when someone has said something it ought not to, and everyone else holds its tongue and waits for the one who oughtn't have said, it is sorry. Who oughtn't to have said, it is sorry. The silence was broken by a sigh. A breath suddenly let out. The children's heads turned as if there had been a string tied to each nose and someone had pulled all the strings at once and everyone saw the sand fairy sitting quite close to them with the expression which it used with the expression which it used as a smile on its hairy face good morning it said i did that quite easily everyone wants him now it doesn't matter said robert sulkily because he knew he had been, been behaving rather like a pig no matter who wants him 
There's no one here to, anyhow. Ingratitude, said the Samoyad. It's a dreadful vice. We're not ungrateful, Jane. We're not ungrateful, Jane made haste to say. But we didn't really want that wish. Robert only just said it. Can you take it back and give us a new one? No, I can't. The sand fairy said shortly, chopping and changing, it's not business. You ought to be careful what you do wish. There was a little boy once. He'd wished for a plesiosaurus instead of an ichthyosaurus, because he was too lazy to remember the easy names of everyday things and his father had been very vexed with him and he made him go to bed before tea time and wouldn't let him go out in the nice flint boat along with the other children. It was the annual school treat next day. And he came and flung himself down near me on the morning of the treat, and he kicked his little prehistoric legs about, and said he wished he was dead, and of course then he was. How awful, said the children all together. Only till sunset, of course, the Samiad said. Still, it was quite enough for his father and mother, and he caught it when... And he caught it when he woke up, I can tell you. He didn't turn to stone. I forget why. But there must have been some reason. They didn't know being dead is only being asleep. And you're bound to wake up somewhere or other. Either way you go to sleep or in some better place. You may be sure he caught it, giving them such a turn. Why, he wasn't allowed to taste megarithium for a month after that. Nothing but oysters and periwinkles and common things like that. Uh, when it says, you may be sure he caught it, that means he was very much told off by his parents for worrying them. All the children were quite crushed by this terrible tale. They looked at the Samiad in horror. Suddenly, the lamb perceived that something brown and furry was near him. Poof, poof, poofy, he said, and made a grab. It's not a pussy, Anthea was beginning, when the sand fairy leapt back. Oh, my left whisker, it said. Don't let him touch me. He's wet. Its fur stood on end with horror. And indeed, a good deal of the ginger beer had been spilt on the blue smock of the lamb. The Samiad dug with its hands and feet and vanished in an instant and a whirl of sand. The children marked the spot with a ring of stones. We may as well get along home, said Robert. I'll say I'm sorry, but anyway, if it's no good, it's no harm and we know where the sandy thing is for tomorrow. The others were noble. No one reproached Robert at all. Cyril picked up the lamb, who was now quite himself again, and off they went by the safe cart road. By the safe cart road. The cart road from the gravel pits joins the road almost directly. At the gate into the road, the party stopped to shift the lamb from Cyril's back to Robert's. And as they paused, a very smart open carriage came in sight with a coachman and a groom on the box. And inside the carriage, a lady, very grand indeed, with a dress all white lace and red ribbons and a parasol all red and white and a white fluffy dog on her lap with a red ribbon round its neck. She, she looked at the children and particularly at the baby and she smiled at him. The children were used to this for the lamb was as all the servants said, a very taking child. So they waved their hands politely to the lady and expected her to drive on, but she did not. Instead, she made the coachman stop and she beckoned to Cyril. And when he went up to the carriage, she said, what a dear darling duck of a baby. Oh, I should so like to adopt it. Do you think its mother would mind? She'd mind very much indeed, said Anthea shortly. Oh, but I should bring it up in luxury, you know. I am Lady Chittenden. You must have seen my photograph in the illustrated papers. They call me a beauty, you know, but of course that's all nonsense. Anyway. She opened the carriage door and jumped out. She had the wonderfullest red high-heeled shoes with silver buckles. Let me hold him a minute, she said. And she took the lamb and held him very awkwardly, as if she was not used to babies. Then suddenly she jumped into the carriage with the lamb in her arms and slammed the door and said, Drive on! The lamb roared, the little white dog barked and the coachman hesitated. Drive on, I tell you, cried the lady. And the coachman did, for, as he said afterwards, it was as much as his place was worth not to. It was as much as his place was worth not to. Okay. 
The four children looked at each other and then, with one accord, they rushed after the carriage and held on behind. Down the dusty road went the smart carriage and after it, at double quick time, ran the twinkling legs of the lamb's brothers and sisters. The lamb howled louder and louder, but presently his howls changed by slow degree to hiccupy gurgles and then all was still and they knew he had gone to sleep. The carriage went on and the eight feet that twinkled through the dust were growing quite stiff and tired before the carriage stopped at the lodge of a grand park. The children crouched down behind the carriage and the lady got out. She looked at the baby as it lay on the carriage seat and hesitated. The darling, I won't disturb it, she said, and went into the lodge to talk to the woman there about setting off. About her setting off Buff Orpington. The darling, I won't disturb it, she said, and went into the lodge to talk to the woman there about her setting off Buff Orpington eggs that had not turned out well. The coachman and footman sprang from the box and bent over the sleeping lamb. Fine boy, wish he was mine, said the coachman. He wouldn't favour you much, said the groom sourly, too handsome. The coachman pretended not to hear. He said, I wonder at her now. I do really. Hates kids, got none of her own, and can't abide other folkses. The children, crouching in the white dust under the carriage, exchanged uncomfortable glances. Tell you what, the coachman went on firmly. Blowed if I don't hide the little nipper in the hedge and tell her his brothers took him. Then I'll come back for him afterwards. No, you don't, said the footman. I've took to that kid so as never was. If anyone's to have him, it's me. So there. Stow your gab, the coachman rejoined. You don't want no kids, and if you did, one kid's the same as another to you. But I'm a married man and a judge of breed. I knows a first-rate yearling when I sees him. I'm a going out of him, and least said soonest mended. I should have thought, said the footman sneeringly, you'd a most enough. What with Alfred and Albert, and Louise and Victor, Stanley and Helena, Stan, Victor Stanley and Helena Beatrice, and another. The coachman hit the footman in the chin. The footman hit the coachman in the waistcoat. The next minute, the two were fighting here and there, in and out, up and down, and all over everywhere. And the little dog jumped on the box of the carriage and began barking like mad. Cyril, still crouching in the dust, waddled on bent legs to the side of the carriage farthest from the battlefield. He unfastened the door of the carriage. The two men were far too much occupied with their quarrel to notice anything. Took the lamb in his arms and, still stooping, carried the sleeping baby a dozen yards along the road to where a stile led into a wood. The others followed and there, among the hazels and young oaks and sweet chestnuts, covered by high, strong-scented bracken. They all lay hidden till the, till the angry voices of the men were hushed at the angry voice of the red and white lady. And after a long and anxious search, the carriage at last drove away. My only hat, said Cyril, drawing a deep breath, as the sound of wheels at last died away. Everyone does want him now, and no mistake. That Samiad has done us again, tricky brute, for any sake. Let's get the kids safe home. So they peeped out and finding on the right hand only lonely white road and nothing but lonely white road to the left, they took courage and the road, Anthea carrying the sleeping lamb. Okay, year eight. So what I would like you to do now then is carry on reading up until the end of chapter, the end of the chapter. So you're going to read from page 51 to the end and then you will be set a task to do after your chapter. I hope you enjoyed the part of the story that I read and I hope you enjoy the rest of it. Um, take care and I will speak to you. I will see you uh, next week.